wonderful that was. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories. I found them very engaging and uh, inspiring even. And I'm sure that our students have a lot of questions. You <coughs> on a lot of similar points. I heard the word passion being mentioned quite a few times. People talking about uncertainty, not knowing what you want to do, and then finding your way, changing careers while in Fairfield and then after Fairfield. And I'm sure that uh, these touch on a lot of questions that the students currently have as they face the, the future. So um, I'm opening it up to you, and I hope to hear your voices. Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. It was extraordinarily helpful to listen to your advice. I'm a, gonna, I'm a senior, I'm gonna be graduating in May, so it's so helpful to hear everything, all your wisdom. And I was just wondering, as language majors and minors, how were you, how did you specifically leverage your language, like, in the job process? Like, was that, um, you meant, it definitely came up, it sounds like it was a very common theme throughout, whether it was, you know, in your current position, or maybe even through the application. Do you think something like writing your cover letter in that language that you speak, um, that could be advantageous? Like, how did you like specifically distinguish yourself with that skill? Um, I didn't really leverage it. I was kind of just, I was the only one on my team that spoke Spanish. So it was kind of just like, it's you or no one. <laughs> um, but we have hired for positions that need the language skills. And it's definitely, we have an internal recruiter, um, and she doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese or the language that we need. So it, it's definitely paramount to understand that the candidate that we're interviewing understands the language fully. Um, so I think that's actually a great idea. You know, if you're reaching out to a position that specifically requires a language skill, why not, you know, leverage that you are fluent in that language because you need to be able to demonstrate it both written and verbally. Um, and just reach out, network. Uh, I mean, LinkedIn should be for all your seniors somewhere where you're on every day. If you see someone in a position that you're interested in, reach out, maybe in Spanish, you know, and maybe try and schedule a call, um, a cup of coffee. I mean, if they're willing, I mean, a lot of people love to meet new people, and if you catch the right person, it would never hurt. Can I just follow up on that? Um, I would, again, when when I spoke of the letter of recommendation, uh, that would also address that. I think um, it's important also to be very clear as to your level of expertise. Um, you know, if you have sort of a working knowledge of a language as opposed to being fluent in the language, and I think your your language instructors can help you peg exactly where you are and, and what you should be uh, you know, declaring as, as your competence. And then I think also in the cover letter, it's important to point out that it's not just about the language, that it is something, you know, that this is part of uh, sort of cross-cultural expertise that you've developed, and whether that's through study abroad or whether it's even working in a multilingual environment, such as a restaurant. Um, that That's something I think that's really important to point out. Um, if you're unable to study abroad in a Spanish-speaking country, are there any other things that you did maybe that you think would help to further your like Spanish speaking practice or language practice that wouldn't require going to another country that you could do in the US. Um, so is there still a Spanish club? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well I know when I was here one thing we did was sorry I'm getting feedback. Um, we invited all of the students, I don't know if there, there probably still are students here from universities in Spain or Spanish-speaking countries. Um, so we invited them to all of our Spanish club meetings. And we would have, um, when I was abroad, we had intercambios. So you'd be assigned someone, and um, they wanted to practice their English just as much as you wanted to practice your Spanish. So we, I kind of tried to bring that back to campus. And um, whether it be just at a meeting or a couple times we went out to dinner and just spoke with them, and that really helped. So um, if you're not in Spanish club, get there and try to make that happen, because I, I think that would be great. <laughs> Smiles 
That is a great question. Um, so, Simply Smiles is a not-for-profit organization. We're based in Norwalk, but we do community development work with indigenous populations um, in Oaxaca, Mexico, so southern Mexico, and on the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation in South Dakota, working with um, the Lakota people out there. And Simply Smiles is based on a philosophy that we all have the power to help someone else. We all have the power to make someone smile. And that's the first building block towards putting kids, adults, anyone um, on the path to a brighter future, which sounds super cheesy. But um, I went on the first trip just as a high school senior, not really expecting much out of it. And I really just felt um, and believed so fully in the philosophy that you could connect with someone, um, even if you didn't speak Spanish, even if I didn't take Spanish in high school, that you can connect with people on that level and then really work together to find a solution to the problems that they face. So um, we do a lot of work um, in both communities to provide food aid, to provide medical care. We build homes and schools, provide college scholarships. We just recently offered um, a student from the reservation a scholarship to Fairfield University. So she just found out on Saturday that she was accepted. So that will be pretty exciting. No pressure on her. She can decide not to come, but um, I would really love for her to come and um, be a fellow stag. So we do a lot. Um, I am never bored at my job, which is really great. We do um, a service trip through the university to the reservation every year the last week of August. Um, to your question about what you can do um, if you don't study abroad, service trips are a great opportunity to do that. I was involved with Simply Smiles and so never went on a university-specific trip throughout my time here. But um, even if you aren't fortunate enough to be able to afford to go to another country, there are lots of service opportunities um, here in Connecticut working with communities in Bridgeport and um, just across the country. So that's a great way to, to connect. And we have resources for you in the department. We need some. I have a question for James. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your Fulbright experience? How did you distinguish yourself in the application? Because those must be incredibly competitive, particularly for Italy. And what kind of work did you do? Uh, okay, I, I don't necessarily know how I distinguished myself. Um, in fact, I, this would kind of answer the first question. I didn't know that I was fluent in Italian until I wrote that application. Uh, that's where I first put the words fluent. Um, and that was on the advice of uh, professors here. Um, I think that what helped me with the application was uh, a focus on what I wanted to do when I got there. Uh, it also didn't hurt that uh, there was this three or four year period where uh, Italy in particular was offering more Fulbrights. Uh, Italy is actually the first country that uh, had the Fulbright grant, so it was an anniversary. Um, but I, I was really focused on what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, research a, this is where it might get boring, right? I wanted to research uh, a, partic a religious persecution that took place uh, in Calabria in like 1560. Um, and then kind of tie that to the larger uh, counter-reformation movement that was going on. Uh, usually when you read about that or hear about it in uh, class in high school or college, it's northern Italy or central Italy, and, and I was really focused on the south. I think they liked that. I think a lot of the applications probably are for um, you know Florence or Bologna, Rome. Uh, and then the experience there was wonderful. Uh, like I said, I, I spent most of my days in either a library or going to uh, Cosenza, which is in the northern part of Calabria. And uh, you know, a few hours during the week, I was in two different Italian high schools. Um, Italian high schools, the state schools, they're supposed to be a mother tongue teacher in the room uh, for uh, English classes. So that was technically my task there. I was the mother tongue English teacher. I learned uh, in a lot of the schools in southern Italy, there is no mother tongue English teacher. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't two teachers in the room, but neither one speaks English, usually. Um, 
And so that experience, I, you know, not so much the study one, but that really uh, made me feel confident in researching and living in Italy um, and just, uh, you know, understanding the, the way down there, especially in this asked if in social work there seems to be a need for other languages in addition to Spanish. Um, I mean, during my time as a social worker, I would say Spanish was the primary language that we desperately needed. Um, I can say as a nurse in Bridgeport, I'm seeing a lot more uh, Muslim patients, um, also Portuguese-speaking patients. No, Portuguese is not Spanish. <laughs> um, <laughs> They tell me a lot she speaks Spanish, but it sounds weird because <laughs> it's not. So, um, <laughs> um, so in New York City, Spanish, uh, in my experience, was was the most common here as well. But I'm seeing other languages up here. So it's not to say it's not existing in New York. It just wasn't my experience. Thank you. Oh, that's helpful. Hi, hi everybody. Now my question was about internships, because that's definitely something that seems like a reoccurring thread and opportunities during the summertime. Um, how were you finding most of your internships? It sounds like you had yours that came from, high, you also had a great connection from the high school from that internship. Everybody else, how were you finding these internships in the summertime? The Career Center here at Fairfield. The Career Center? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if you haven't stopped in yet, I highly recommend you go there ASAP. Uh, it's, I think it's only grown since I've been there. I think when I was in 2008, it was only Kathleen. <laughs> uh, from what I hear, it's a lot bigger. Um, I think that's an opportunity that should be leveraged tenfold. Um, they have incredible resources, incredible connections, uh, contacts to get you an internship. Whether it's something that you might love or not, it's still exposure to a different area that maybe you might love down the road. Um, but the Career Center, I think, in Fairfield is, is somewhere where you should go ASAP. And I um, found my internship through an email from Dolan School of Business straight to my inbox. So it was the only one I applied to, and I was very lucky. But um, I did use the Career Planning Center a lot, um, just practicing interviews with Kath and um, when I was you know, looking at other opportunities as well. Recommend to open your professor's emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that too. <laughs> and if anyone is interested in GE, you know, feel free to talk to me. That's great. So um, that's wonderful with that invitation to come speak with you on the mention of the Career Planning Center. Uh, perhaps we could conclude the evening. If anybody has any questions for our panelists, come up. Let's, let's speak to them one-on-one, uh, -on -one. maybe do a little bit of networking, um, grab a cookie, have some coffee, and then uh, thank you for all for coming. Thank you.